everyone to our seventh virtual presentation in the York Sunbury Historical Society speaker series. I'm Melinda Jarrett and I'm the executive director of the Fredericton Region Museum. I'll be your host for tonight's program. Now the virtual speaker series was organized by Charles Ferris, member of the society's board of directors, and he's the society's programs committee chair. We're also fortunate to have the assistance of IT with uh, Stephen Thomas, who has helped us to set up the event tonight on Zoom, and committee member Peter Malmberg, who helped us with the publicity and promotion. I'm going to ask Dr. Bill Parento of the formerly recently retired from UNB's history department to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Uh, thanks, Melinda. Thank you for the invite. I'm excited. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Nicholas Tracy. Uh, Nicholas has had, has, uh, had a long, uh, fascinating, and ultimately highly successful career uh, in, a, in, a, in a really fascinating journey as a, in his academic life. It began as, uh, with a BA from the University of Saskatchewan and both an MPhil and a PhD from the University of Southampton, UK. Uh, as well as making several stops at other universities and research institutes, uh, Nicholas began his affiliation and teaching for the history department uh, in the 1980s uh, and has been with us ever since. Um, as, a, as first as a sessional instructor and then as an adjunct professor um, if I can editorialize a bit, I, I might say that, uh, you know, I worked as a part-time instructor in Ottawa for several years, and um, there's this weird kind of thing in academia where um, people tend to put scholars into categories. One is those who are worthy and have tenure track positions, and those who are a little less worthy and depend upon stipendiary teaching. This always seemed really silly to me. Uh, because I could never figure out how when I got hired by UNB, I was that much smarter than I was the day before. So, um, you know, Nicholas really, you know, the UNB History Department has been blessed um, with really high quality uh, teachers and scholars who, who work uh, on a, on a part-time basis. Um, and I'm first among those really is Nicholas Tracy. A uh, world-class naval historian uh, who's done an enormous amount of teaching in a variety of formats for the department and has had a world-class career as a, as a naval historian. Um, he's also been generous with his time to the history department, participating in both the intellectual and social life of the department. And as you can see tonight, uh, is committed to um, the wider community in terms of his intellectual activities. I, ca I can't really begin to go through all of Nicholas's publications. It's a voluminous and highly impressive record. Um, and it, it extends beyond academic history uh, into the realm of popular history. Now, there was a time where if you got a room full of historians together and you put popular and history together in the same phrase, both of which are very good things, popular and history, then it would be looked on in a fairly negative way. It was a pejorative term. I think we're getting over that, thankfully. Uh, you know, and Nicholas certainly has made a large impact uh, both in the academic world uh, and in the, in the dissemination of, uh, of popular history. And I, I commend him for that. Um, uh, tonight, his presentation is Master and Madman, The Surprising Rise and Disastrous Fall of the Honorable Anthony Lockwood, RN, one of the early uh, surveyor generals. Um, and please join me in welcoming uh, Nicholas and enjoying him rescue from what E.P. Thompson called the enormous condescension of posterity. So I'm going to turn it over to Nicholas and I may be back, I don't know, to try to answer questions. Thank you, Bill. Uh, yes, I hope you will hang around. Maybe you'll know something that I don't, which is probably quite plausible. Uh, anyway, uh, tonight I'm 
I, I trying to encapsulate the contents of the book uh, that, that Bill just mentioned, Master and Madman, uh, Spectacular Rise and Disastrous Fall of the Honorable Anthony Lockwood Royal Navy. Peter Thomas uh, of the UNB English Department spent the best part of 20 years researching Lockwood's life and asked me on his deathbed if I would complete it and see it published. That commitment took me a year checking and putting into order Peter's sources and subjecting his draft to repeated rewrites. Uh, the title given by my publishers hints at the drama of the story, but also diminishes it. It is important to see Lockwood's life and struggle in a Shakespearean scale. His rise to high office in New Brunswick as an honorable, and as a right-hand man of the Lieutenant Governor, Major General George Stracy Smythe, was the story of a man born into profound poverty in a highly structured society. Thomas Bailey, who succeeded him as Surveyor General of New Brunswick and came to be one of the wealthiest men in the colony, was the younger brother of the first secretary of the colonial office. By contrast, Lockwood's recorded life begins when he entered the Royal Navy in Iphigenia on 18th of April, 1795 in Port Royal, Jamaica. It is probable that he was pressed into service and possibly out of a slave ship. Lockwood's story uh, illustrates wonderfully the upward mobility possible in the Royal Navy during this time of extreme turbulence and change, but also illustrates the perils that lay in the path of those who refused to accept that humble birth set bounds to ambition. Few people began their flight of Icarus from so lonely a position lowly, not lowly, but his mercantile service was enough for the Navy to rate him as a master's mate, which in the conditions of wartime was firmly on the bottom rung of a ladder that could lead to promotion and social privilege. His service became that of a hydrographer, where he was able to avoid close oversight and carve his own way. He nearly destroyed himself by quarreling with uh, Admiral Sir James uh, Sumarez during his survey of the Channel Islands in, in 1805 on Sumarez's home turf and four years after Sumarez had become a national hero after the Battle of Algeciras. But he was more fortunate in finding a patron in Admiral Alexander Cochrane, who in 1807 was commissioned Commander-in-Chief North America. Cochrane appointed Lockwood acting surveyor of the Barbados Naval Yard where he set up a menage with a mulatto woman, Harriet Hannibal Lee, whose daughter, Marina, Anthony acknowledged as his own and brought from England his two children from an earlier marriage, Anthony Jr. and Martha. At the end of the War of 1812, Lockwood was commissioned to upgrade the survey of Nova Scotia that had been made by Joseph Frederick Wallet Desbarre. He set up home in Halifax and carried out his survey of Nova Scotia waters, or at least he went through the motions. He ran surveys up the eastern shore and around the south coast to Briar Island, Grand Man, and St. John. He prepared a brief description of Nova Scotia with plates of the principal harbors, including a particular account of the island of Grand Manan. But the perfunctory nature of his survey suggests that he knew that his employment would come to an end at the end of the war, and, and that his mind was more on getting the next job than it was on doing the one in hand. In his report, he noted the importance of the light on Briar Island as an aid to shipping heading to the port of St. John. And he recommended that another be located on Cranberry Island at the mouth of the, uh, of the Strait of Canso as a guide to shipping heading for the Miramichi. He sent a copy of that re recommendation to the New Brunswick Executive Council following uh, the death in 1807, 1817 of the first Surveyor General of New Brunswick, George Spruill, clearly hoping to succeed him. He used the report in 1819 as part of his petition to the Treasury Board and against all the odds and in defiance of the better claims of descendants of the Empire Loyalists, he was given the position and also that of Receiver General. Later, he was to be instrumental in seeing that both these lights were paid for in part by the New Brunswick government. 
where he found the influence needed to get the appointment is a mystery. Although as a master Royal Navy, he did have technical qualifications. He had never exhibited the sort of subservience usually to be found in policemen. When he took command of the survey ship in, in Halifax, he had named her the examiner. Now the name is perfectly appropriate for a survey vessel, but there might have been a, a political and seditious implication. The examiner was also the title of Lee Hunt's reformist weekly London newspaper, notoriously hostile to government policy. For scathing criticism in the examiner in March 1812 of the Prince of Wales, Prince Regent and future King George IV, Hunt and his brothers were sentenced to two years in separate prisons. During his brief period in office from 1819 to 1823, which is not even noted in the Wikipedia lists of surveyors general and latterly ministers of natural resources, Lockwood vigorously promoted the needs of immigrants surveyed roads, settlements, the First Nations lands, and made the first preliminary survey for a, a canal across the Signecto Marsh. As Surveyor General, Lockwood was a member of the New Brunswick Executive Council, and he developed a good relationship with Smythe, the Lieutenant Governor. Now, Smythe was a lonely man and a bitter one, because his young wife had not been well received in New Brunswick. But she had died in July, seven months before his appointment in February 1817. His great consolation during his life was music, and Lockwood's relationship with him seemed to have included their mutual love of music. And like Smythe, Lockwood was an isolated figure as a sailor in a colony dominated by the army and missing his common law Bohemian wife, Harriet. He had enjoyed the company of a woman in Halifax who bore a child which he was willing to acknowledge as his own. But now in New Brunswick, he arranged passage for Harriet to come to St. John. In what was possibly the first mixed race marriage in New Brunswick, he married her on 23 of May, 1820. The three most prominent leaders in New Brunswick's religious establishments were in attendance. Reverend Willis, rector of Trinity Church where the marriage took place, James Milne, rector of Christ Church in Fredericton, and Dr. George Burns, minister of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Kirk in St. John. It was not likely that Lockwood's family were well received by those who had given Smythe's wife a cold shoulder. His own attitude to race was a complicated one, possibly beginning with merchant service on a slave ship, but then being practically a slave himself as an impressed sailor in the Royal Navy. His acting as acting superintendent of the Barbados dockyard, he had purchased several slaves and employed them for his own benefit in the dockyard, and then taken them with him to Nova Scotia, where they were employed on his survey ship. He had also purchased a slave for the benefit of his estranged common law wife in England. The evidence suggests that he had a good relationship with the seamen on the ship, including the slaves, but he hastily returned them to Barbados and sold them when it became evident that trade in slaves was to be banned. Against that cruelty was his defiance of local opinion by marrying Harriet. After Smythe's death on 27 March 1823, a marble memorial was commissioned which mentioned Smythe's support for the black community. This suggests another area of sympathy between Smythe and Lockwood and possibly isolation from the Fredericton community. The memorial can be seen in Christchurch Cathedral. Father Ross Hebb has reported on the evidence of interracial harmony in the parish of St. Mary upriver from Fredericton, but he made the point that it was unique as far as he was able to discover. Racial divide was the norm, and even the political reformer William Cobbett, who had served as company clerk in the Fredericton garrison in 1787 was adamantly opposed to the mixing of races. Lockwood evidently had been waiting all his life for the recognition his appointment had given him, and he strove to justify that status by his hard work and solid support for the general. But all that, all that came crashing to ruin following Smythe's death. It was almost certainly a personal crisis for Lockwood, as his close partnership with Smythe had been his shield against colonial envy. 
and it precipitated a constitutional crisis in New Brunswick in which Lockwood uh, desperately overplayed his hand. Uh, before going into that, though, I think we'll take a few minutes, Stephen, and have a look at the slides that I've brought along to illustrate this. Okay, good. Okay, the first slide is a Lockwood sketch of clearing wrecks in Carlisle Bay, Antigua, uh, as part of his, his work as a, a surveyor of the Barbados dockyard. Next. This isn't uh, anything particularly to do with Lockwood, but it uh, shows the quality of the uh, chart work at, in Halifax before Lockwood got there, about, uh, what, about uh, 50 years before. So it's not really that pertinent, but it's, I thought it would be interesting. Next slide. Now this is a letter from Lockwood with a, a very faintly, you can see the sketch of Cranberry Island where he recommended that a lighthouse be built on the Council Street. Next sketch. And here's a, a sketch she made of uh, Seal Island, which is uh, uh, south of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. And a place he also recommended there should be a light to uh, assist shipping heading to the port of St. John. And it's really interesting that uh, uh, he thought the, uh, the lights that served the shipping of St. John, even though they weren't in New Brunswick, should be paid for by the New Brunswick government. Okay, next sketch. Our next slide. This this is a, a sketch of uh, Gannet Rock, uh, uh, which is um, uh, seaward of Grand Manan. Uh, it's uh, a quick in, uh, ink sketch, and you can see there's a blot of ink in the upper side where his pen dripped. Okay, next. And this is a much more finished chart. In fact, it's a big one. It's a pity that uh, I can't you can't really see it, but it's uh, a, a chart of the mouth of uh, Saint John River. At, and the harbor of St. John. Next. Uh, again, this is not um, uh, Lockwood's own survey of the Chignetto Canal. It's the first um, uh, one that actually took physical form. And, and it's interesting uh, that uh, when uh, the St. John uh, merchant community began actively supporting the idea of a Chignetto Canal, uh, Lockwood wasn't uh, asked to uh, carry on with the work that he had uh, started initially. And it's, it's one of the evidence that uh, his uh, mental state was beginning to be uh, noticed in the community. Okay, next. This is uh, Lockwood's survey of the uh, uh, Rishabukta Reserve lands. Uh, yeah, and I think that the dark bits are the bits that are uh, reserved for the the, uh, the, the uh, Aboriginal community. If so, it's uh, it's rather short short comments uh, for them. And let's see, next slide. This is just a uh, contemporary uh, engraving of the Kennebecasis near St. John. Next. Same thing in color. Next. And uh, a contemporary uh, engraving of the port of St. John. Next. Again, same thing in color. Uh, the, it was the practice at that time to, uh, because the uh, engravings weren't colored, uh, that uh, uh, people could earn a small livelihood by uh, adding watercolor uh, to the, uh, the engravings and selling them for selling them on at a higher price. Okay, next. And this is another um, engraving of the Port of St. John. Okay, carry on. And again in color. Next. Now this is uh, the barracks and market house in Fredericton, uh, an uh, engraving by 
or attributed to John Elliott Wolford, who's a, a soldier uh, artist who uh, uh, came out to uh, Nova Scotia, first of all, with uh, the Earl of Dalhousie, and then uh, became barrack master in Fredericton. Next, uh, sl slaying party on the St. John River. Uh, again, it's, a, it's attributed to John Elliott Wolford, but an awful lot of things were. So, uh, as soon as anybody got a reputation, everybody likes to tax a name onto the pictures that might or might not have been done by the uh, more influential artist. Okay, next. This is the officer's barracks. It doesn't look quite like the way it does now, so uh, I don't know whether the artist wasn't looking or whether uh, alterations took place between then and now. Okay, next picture. Here's the here's province house. And the uh, small building to the right of the uh, um, of, of the grouping there was the Surveyor General's office and Receiver General. So that's where Lockwood worked uh, when he was at home. Most of the time he was away out on his horse uh, doing surveys, but uh, that's that's where his office work took place. Okay, next. So well, that's just a winter scene, probably in Fredericton. Uh, it's uh, Bit romantic perhaps but uh, anyway next this is the, the governor's residence in in Fredericton uh, an oil painting okay next the general Smythe uh, a, a st. John steamboat now this is not the, the one that uh, that uh, Lockwood actually uh, traveled on and dot and uh, Dalhousie traveled on but uh, it's it's similar it's about, uh, what's the date of that one? Oh, uh, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a few years later than the next slide. And this, these are not terribly interesting, but that's uh, a receipt for firewood to, uh, for, for the steamboat. Next. And uh, a, a claim for warpage costs uh, for the steamboat. Okay, next. And this is a letter that Lockwood wrote on the steamboat. I'll tell you about it in a few minutes, uh, in which he's, uh, well, he's in, in a distressed situation. Uh, uh, Peter uh, thought that the uh, uh, shaky hand was an indication of, of his uh, uh, mental state, but I think it was probably just because he was writing on a steamboat with a reciprocating engine and the whole uh, whole desk was shaking. But uh, who knows? Uh, and next, this is the, the last slide and it's the uh, UK dust, dust jacket for the book. Uh, it's quite a different one in, here in, in Canada, but it, uh, and, and this is what the, uh, what the English uh, think of, uh, a, a sailor who's getting out of hand a bit. <laughs> the continuation of the New Brunswick government after Smythe's death should have been ensured by appointment as temporary president of the executive council of the, of the eldest member of the council, George Leonard. But Leonard had suffered a stroke and had not left his home in Sussex to attend meeting of council for 15 years. The next eldest was Christopher Billop, who also was elderly and apparently somewhat senile and only attended meetings of council when they could be held at his own house in St. John. In the circumstances, the next in line and most active senior member of the council, Ward Chipman, obtained the agreement of a quorum of council and was himself sworn in as president at the seat of government in Fredericton. But several St. John residents objected and stirred up Billup to insist upon his rights asserting that the government of uh, New Brunswick could just as well be conducted from the lo Loyalist city. And this, of course, wasn't just that they wanted Philip. They really resented the idea that government should be held in Fredericton when it should be in the bigger center of St. John. The plot then thickened further 
when Leonard decided that if the government did not need to be conducted for Fredericton, Sussex would do just as well as St. John. Into this crisis, Lockwood unwisely left. Here we have to make clear that Lockwood did indeed suffer a mental breakdown. But mental illness should not be seen as reducing his story to that of a freak show. Rather, it paints it as a tragedy. Peter Thomas was interested in the romantic trope that creativity and madness go together. And I, uh, I agree that the sacrifice of prosaic bourgeois wealth to pursue creative goals sometimes amounts to madness. But mental illness is, is another matter altogether. And I decided I could not pursue that aspect of Thomas's ideas about Lockwood. There were reasons why Lockwood should have been thinking of, along the lines of revolution, apart from his own earlier conflicts with puffed up aristocrats. He had been present at the great 1797 Spithead Mutiny when the ordinary seamen of England forced Parliament to give them the first pay rise in 150 years and forced King George III to give them a royal pardon. Once in Fredericton, he, along with all who read the Fredericton Royal Gazette, followed the story of the king's dissolute son, the Prince of Prince Regent, and his disputes with his wife uh, that he had been forced to marry, Princess Caroline. In 1814, she had chosen to live abroad, and her relationship with her courtier, Bartolomeo uh, Bergandi, uh, led to George III forming a commission on 28th of May, 1816, that included the Lord Chancellor and the Lord Chief Justice to inquire into the truth of alleged adulterous and outrageous behavior by the princess. On New Year's Day, 1818, the regent presented papers to his ministers laying out a case for bringing divorce proceedings against the Princess of Wales, with the underlying purpose of freeing him to father a male heir to the throne. On 25 July 1820, the Fredericton Royal Gazette announced that following the death of George III, the coronation of his son would take place on the 11th of August. Just below the coronation notice, however, dated London 8th uh, June, came the following. Arrival of the Queen of England. This long surmised and till of late unlooked for event has at last taken place. Her Majesty having landed at Dover on Monday last and arrived in London on Tuesday evening. The effect was explosive. George persuaded the cabinet to have Caroline's name omitted from the liturgy of the Church of England, of which the King was head as defender of the faith, and the coronation was postponed. He was advised not to seek a divorce because of his own adulterous relationships, but inevitably brought up in the trial. And accordingly, he demanded the introduction in Parliament on 5 July of the Pains and Penalties Bill 1820, under which the marriage could be annulled and Caroline stripped of the title of Queen, without a trial in a court of law. Her impeachment failed, however, despite passing through the House because of the public support she gained. The coronation of George IV at West Westminster Abbey, 19th of July, 1821, would be described by the Royal Gazette in a lengthy account on 18th September as a splendid pageant. However, it was impossible to avoid reference to Queen Caroline's attempt to gain entry to the ceremony and the fact that she was turned away from the very doors of the Abbey. To make matters worse, on 25 September, 1821, she died suddenly, believing that she had been poisoned. These events were profoundly disturbing in New Brunswick, where the monarchy was the heart of social and political order, more so even than it was at, 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 in the homeland. New Brunswick's franchise was wider than that of, of the United Kingdom, and Catholics had been given the vote in 1810, but the House of Assembly had fewer effective powers than did the British Parliament where the restrictions on the monarchy were established by jealously guarded precedent. In 1825, Lieutenant Governor Sir Howard Douglas, who eventually succeeded Smythe, was to write to the first secretary of the colonial office his fears that the British inheritance in New Brunswick was in danger. In a colony bordering upon a Republican government and with which the intercourse is so frequent, 
it is of great importance to check by all practical means the introduction of Republican principles and to sustain and strengthen the King's prerogative in every way in which it can be done without touching upon the privileges to which the popular branch of the legislature have firmly established their claim. This, in a country where there is nothing like a hereditary aristocracy, must always be attended with some difficulty. It was not only the British throne that was tottering. In 1820 uh, was a year of revolts in Europe, forcing the monarchs of Spain and the southern Italian kingdom of the two Sicilies to grant liberal constitutions. Welcome as that might be, it was also worrying to the British elite, even those in the colonies. After all, it had been revolution that had spawned Napoleon and the Bourbon monarchs of Sicily and Spain had done what they could to stem the tide of Napoleonic revolt. No less interesting in New Brunswick than the drama of events in Southern Europe was the news of revolution in the Spanish Empire, where Simon Bolivar established the independent Republic of Gran Colombia in 1819. On the face of it, Lockwood was too busy participating in the King's government of New Brunswick to pay much attention to revolutionary news from Latin America, or to interest himself in the uh, humiliation of the monarchy and the agitation for political reform in England. But these issues were certainly the talk of the town, and probably amongst the councillors. It is not surprising that the image of the man on horseback sweeping away the accumulated baggage of the past should have lodged itself in his mind, where he found it when mental illness broke down his self-control. A third element in New Brunswick's life that may have determined the form taken by Lockwood's derangement in 1823 was a duel fought between George Street and George Wetmore, the sons of Samuel Denny Street and Thomas Wetmore, respectively, on, in October of 1821 on Maryland Hill, just outside Fredericton. George Wetmore, Wetmore died at 10.15 a.m. from a gunshot wound to the head. The immediate cause of the quarrel had been a court case in which the men were rival barristers. George Street appearing for the sheriff of uh, York County and Edward W. Miller, uh, sorry, the sheriff, Edward W. Miller, who was accused of false arrest, while George Wetmore acted for the plaintiff. The struggle for power between Warden Chipman and Christopher Billup, with both on shaky constitutional ground, may have seemed to create an opportunity for Lockwood, always on the lookout for ways of bettering himself, to become the dominant figure in New Brunswick. He might have been right about that, had he kept a firm grasp on realities. But the dejection he had been suffering from through the winter was transformed into a mania, which proved his downfall. And when he fell, in the words that Shakespeare put into the mouth of disgraced Cardinal Wolsey, he fell like Lucifer, never to hope again. Lockwood had been present at the council meeting on 1 May when Billups' proclamation was discussed. He was absent at the meetings on 2 and 3 May, 1823, but he likely heard about Leonard's letter of the 2nd, indicating that he was not disinclined to assume the government if only he did not have to travel to Fredericton for the purpose. Lockwood, the man of action, mounted his horse and plunged off along Myra Roads on his way to Sussex Vale to persuade Leonard to withdraw his resignation from the presidency of the government. The evidence is that, that Leonard found him an alarming guest, but the upshot was that he issued a proclamation, uh, that is, Leonard issued a proclamation dated the 24th, which may be assumed was dictated by Lockwood. To prevent all future contests and confusion among the good and loyal people of this province, Leonard wrote, I now therefore assume my right to the administration of the government and direct the members of his majesty's council and the secretary of the province to assemble at my residence in Sussex Vale on the sixth day of June next at midday for the purpose of administering the oaths of office and necessary to qualify me for the discharge of the duties which must now devolve upon me as president of the province. Lockwood added his own signature to the proclamation as acting secretary. 
When Lockwood left Renner, Leonard's residence on the 25th, he headed for St. John in an affidavit that was taken on oath at the meeting of council on the 31st, his friend Robert Minette declared that Lockwood came to the house of this opponent on Sunday the 25th of May instant that the said Anthony Lockwood, although often absent, considered the, the deponent's house as his own home, uh, that this opponent had seen the said Anthony Lockwood daily since the said 25th of May, and he was clearly deranged and not fit, unfit for office. Lockwood was visited at Minette's house by Dr. Paddock and took the medicines prescribed, but altogether disregarded his directions in other respects, as well as the advice and admonition given with a view to his safety in person. He frequently used violent expressions, threatening the lives of several persons in the city of St. John, who would either offend him or express the pleasure at his dis, uh, disorderly behavior. On the 27th, still unaware of Leonard's proclamation and the letters that might have been en route to Fredericton by a messenger, Chipman rose early to catch the steamboat to St. John, which sailed at 7 a.m. Was he off to meet with Billet or to track down Lockwood? Probably both. Meet with Lockwood, he certainly did probably on the morning of the 28th. It is even possible that Lockwood had himself carried Leonard's proclamation of letters and now delivered them in person. Chipman's immediate reaction was to communicate his concerns about Lockwood's condition in writing to Dr. Paddock. For his part, Lockwood found Chipman's conduct to be mild and liberal, and this, for the moment, deflected him from his purpose. Following his meeting with, Chip, meeting with Chipman, he dictated a letter in which he rambled on, making it evident that his intentions had been nothing less than a coup de main. Having obtained Leonard's agreement to figurehead the administration, Lockwood wrote that he immediately determined to relinquish the high and important situations held by me and prepare myself to act in the double capacity a civil aide de camp and inspecting field officer for a purpose and to an end that your mild and liberal conduct has rendered totally unnecessary. I now in confidence suggest that you continue in the administration of duty to which you are entitled by your abilities. He may have persuaded Leonard that his assumption of the presidency would reduce political strife, but, he, but it appears that for his own part, he'd been tempted to ride the wave of that strife, taking charge as inspecting field officer. His purpose and end can only have been to enforce Leonard's authority or his own. Chipman now took charge and with great difficulty, he bundled Lockwood on board the steamboat for Fredericton. The next day, the 1st of June was to witness the dramatic end of Lockwood's attempt to take control of the government. If that is how his actions should be characterized. Robert Minette had also made the journey to Fredericton and in his sworn testimony, he said that he met the Honorable Anthony Lockwood this morning, being the first day of June, near his, the said Anthony's dwelling. He appeared to be in a state of great irritation. He had ordered a table and chairs to be placed in the public square, where he drank coffee and ordered the opponent to sit there and copy a proclamation that the said Anthony said he had uh, assumed the government of the province and that he had been forced to do so, that the president had deceived him, and that he would cause him, the president, to be arrested and made a prisoner, and also made use of violent language towards the president, threatening to be the end of him. Lockwood was apparently quite even-handed in his threats, which he also made to the, uh, the gardener at Government House, and all the rest that had offended him. Minette said that he had understood Lockwood to be threatening to kill the said gardener or do him some bodily harm. To give point to his language, he had about him a pair of pocket pistols, but the ends of the barrels were taken off. Minette concluded that the said Anthony appeared to be, appeared to the deponent to be in a state of frenzy and not fit to be trusted to go at large. Lockwood had included the high sheriff of York County 
Edgar W. Miller, Esquire, in his threats, saying that he would displace the sheriff and appoint another. It was Miller, however, who had the last word. In the morning, he reported to the council that he had found the Honorable Anthony Lockwood, the Surveyor General, riding about the streets of Fredericton, armed with pistols and threatening the lives of sundry persons. Miller was also informed of divers acts of outrage and violence committed by the said Anthony Lockwood. He decided it was his duty to arrest Lockwood, which he accordingly did and confined him to the jail of the said county and that the said Anthony is now in confinement in the said jail. His conduct, Miller declared, is such as to leave no doubt in the mind of the deponent that the said Anthony Lockwood is in a state of great mental derangement and totally unfit to go at large. High noon in Fredericton was played out without shots exchanged. As Surveyor General, Lockwood had been asked, had been tasked with designing a replacement for the jail because the old one was condemned as unfit for human habitation. And now he was locked up there, subjected to a commission of lunacy and suspended from his offices. He recovered his wits enough to flee home to Britain, followed by his wife and daughters. But the daughters did not long survive and his wife Harriet disappeared. Remarkably, Anthony married again to another Harriet who seems to have been a poor woman who kept house for him for his pension from the Navy and another pension arranged by the new Lieutenant Governor in New Brunswick, Sir Howard Douglas. He remained an outpatient at the Bethlehem, sorry, uh, 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 the Bethnal Green Hospital for the Insane and died in 1854, 30 years after his fall. Hubris, the fatal mistake of seeking to meet the gods on equal ground, is the stuff of tragedy. Should Lockwood be regarded as a potential Bolivar of New Brunswick, chancing his hard-earned offices for that of a personal aide de comp to the elderly George Leonard, an inspecting field commander? Would the next step have been declared New Brunswick a republic with the backing of the more radical elements in St. John? But what of the regiment courted in Fredericton? There's no evidence that he had courted their, their support. Revolutionaries need a political base and spend years developing one. Lockwood, to all appearances, had not. For a brief hour, riding armed in the streets of Fredericton and threatening his foes with death, he evidently imagined himself as a revolutionary. But Sheriff Miller pulled him off his horse and put him in jail. There his ambitions were combined by four walls and a commission of lunacy. What then should be the last word on Lockwood's life? He has fallen through the cracks of history because of his pathetic demise and his protracted fall into obscurity. Perhaps if Sheriff Miller had shot him off his horse that day on Queen Street, he would now be remembered in Fredericton. But it's not necessary to wish Anthony Lockwood on a monument or in school textbooks as one of the founders of modern New Brunswick. It is enough to remember him as part of suffering humanity, part of the theater of life. A passionate man, a family man, a victim of his humble birth, but, to, but determined to pull himself and his family out of his poverty, who experienced one remarkable stroke of luck, worked exceedingly hard to make a good thing of his new fortune, and then in his prime was struck down by disease. He was not an American, but his story is that of the American dream, and his fall is consistent with the flaw in that vision. Hard work and dedication, passion and commitment are not guarantees of good fortune. Inadequate as were the social and political concepts of colonial New Brunswick, and empty as was the vision of his leaders sustained, sustained of a bucolic Eden governed by, governed by a natural aristocracy. It was based on the idea of community and charity. Those values were expressed imperfectly, but according to the ability of a struggling economy, in the efforts to provide for the immigrants into the province and were also expressed in the concern felt by Howard Douglas to provide for Lockwood and his family after his fall. Lockwood's story is important as much because it is that of every man as because of the heights he scaled and the wreck to which he fell. His madness posed a peculiar problem to the historian, 
Apparently, he attempted self-consciously to erase himself from the public record. Within days of his imprisonment, it was discovered that he destroyed or mutilated the maps, surveys, grant, and timber license books of the Surveyor General's office. It took his three immediate successors, with the assistance of two extra clerks, more than five years to partially reconstruct what was missing. It is therefore impossible to offer anything but an approximate account of what Anthony Lockwood did as Surveyor General. Of his service as Receiver General, only fragments remain. As to Lockwood's personal papers, there is first the evidence of a letter he wrote to the Admiralty on 30th of January, 1818, asking for confirmation of his naval service, the original documents having been lost, he stated, when a merchant brig having on board my books and papers from Barbados bound for St. John, New Brunswick, in November of 1815, suffered wreck upon Partridge Island in the Bay of Fundy. Then in 1833, he was unable to provide the Admiralty with, with accurate dates for a memorial of service, my journals and certificates being destroyed in my dwelling house in Fredericton in North America in 1824. Interestingly, Lockwood's service in New Brunswick coincided with the arrival of the former artist, Anthony Flowers, who took up land on Washington Moek in 1818, and the soldier artist, John Elliot Wolford, who was made barrack master at Fredericton in eight, in, on 23 November, 1821, and remained in Fredericton for 44 years. In the then tiny community of New Brunswick, they must have known each other, but there is no record. Well, that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you very much, Nicholas. That was extremely interesting. I didn't know the full story of uh, Anthony Lockwood. And I see there's some questions here this evening. And I'd also like to uh, thank to, thanks Dr. to Dr. Parento for his introduction of our speaker this evening. But the first question from Evelyn. Um, which was spurred on by that beautiful map of Seal Island. She said, uh, when did he recommend the Seal Island light? And why did he want New Brunswick to fund it? Well, the Seal Island dated 1815. And uh, uh, the, uh, the light was, was needed uh, to uh, assist in shipping into the port of St. John. Uh, the, it wasn't considered important for, uh, for Nova Scotia trade, but for ships that were avoiding Nova Scotia and heading for, for St. John. Same with the uh, Cranberry Island Light uh, on Council Street, uh, which again is in Nova Scotia, but the, tra the trade was heading for Miramichi. Oh, now, uh, Constantine Pissaris would like to ask a question in uh, using his mic. So, Constantine, uh, just unmute yourself, and then I will, or mute, yeah, unmute yourself, and then I'll mute myself. Thank, thanks, Melinda. And Nicholas, uh, thank you very much for this uh, engaging presentation. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, Nicholas, if uh, during uh, Peter and uh, yourself's research on uh, Lockwood, if there are any accounts of him uh, interacting with the indigenous population of New Brunswick. He was involved in uh, surveying uh, indigenous settlements, particularly in the, in the uh, uh, Rishabuktu area. Earlier, uh, when he was uh, working as uh, on the survey of Nova Scotia waters, uh, and he produced a, uh, a guide uh, encouraging settlement in Nova Scotia, and he uh, was uh, uh, he, he, he wasn't particularly uh, uh, enthusiastic about the uh, indigenous community, which he thought were were wastrels and not really earning their living. So uh, it, it's not very positive in that respect. Would you like? To, I know I would like to ask the question, uh, Nicholas. I heard, saw your reference. I heard your reference to uh, Smythe and. The, um, the memorial to him, is it in Christchurch Cathedral downtown, uh, in which it's referenced that he was a friend of the black community? I'm fascinated by that. What's that all about? Well, it would be interesting. And I, I, uh, I asked 
asked Ross Hebb whether he knew anything about this. Uh, the only thing I know about it is is the uh, is the monument in which he uh, is credited with uh, support for schools and, and churches for the black community of uh, New Brunswick. Whereabouts, I don't know. There's another question here from Brenda, Brenda Orr. Uh, hi, Brenda. She said, uh, and another good question too, because this I think is probably part of the reason why it was hard to write his, the book about him was, she says, did I understand that all his papers were destroyed? Well, uh, there are two problems there. Uh, yes, he seemed to have sought to destroy uh, the official records. Uh, this didn't necessarily involve his personal papers, but, uh, but some of those were lost when the, uh, a ship uh, carrying his records from Barbados was sunk uh, uh, on Partridge Island. And then he had a house fire in, in, in Fredericton, which destroyed more of his personal pap papers. But uh, there's also the problem that the provincial records were extremely badly kept. Uh, until quite recently, uh, the uh, the I think they were all in in the uh, legislative building, and just stacked up uh, in in the loft. And I've heard stories about people going and helping themselves to uh, to to the records. And I don't know how much of that is is uh, is, is the case, and how much of it isn't. Bill, do you have any more information about that? Yeah, you know, uh, I heard, I don't know if it might be apocryphal as well, but I, I heard the story that uh, they, they were stored in the basement and there was a flood. So, uh, you know, some, some, uh, a great deal of the colonial records. So, um, yeah. you know, but there's certainly enough for uh, McNutt to write his epic, uh, you know, Confederation history. So, yeah, I wouldn't know about that. I, I, I do question whether uh, he was that diligent in terms of his record keeping as surveyor general in terms of the timber works, because uh, people in his position tended to see their uh, post as a perquisite. And so he, he himself, of course, you know, uh, benefited financially over and above his, uh, his uh, sal salary as term of the civil list. But, you know, um, I wonder, you know, it took him five years to put things in order but I wonder if we can, uh, you know, we can cover some of that by, um, you know, uh, his, his, the future, uh, the guy that followed him, Thomas Bailey, who was the really personification of the sort of stuffed shirt, uh, blown up aristocrat, uh, but was really quite uh, interested in um, using the, uh, the crown lands as an engine for, uh, economic development and uh, himself uh, helped himself to a large part of York County to start his land company uh, with some London investors. So, you know, I wonder, I really want to wonder uh, how much he, he really uh, paid attention to that. Well, it, it certainly is, uh, uh, it's never adequate to, to listen to one politician describing the ruin that he inherited from the previous politician. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you never know well, about that. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, but it's also, uh, Peter s somewhat suspected that the stories of shipwreck and fire were part of, of, his, of his madness rather than of, of reality. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I can't answer that. It's a fascinating story, and uh, you know, it, it speaks well to your uh, dedication to the profession and also uh, your loyalty to your colleagues. So thanks for picking that up. I'm I'm planning on reading it soon. <laughs> <laughs> Good, yeah. Melinda. Okay, I I think that I don't think there's any other questions. Uh, does anyone else have anything? No, in the chat. No, that's fine. Um, I know myself, I, I, I'm very interested in the, the race issues that are raised uh, by uh, Anthony Lockwood's marriage uh, to a mixed race woman from the Bahamas, correct? Yes, indeed. That was uh, it's very interesting. And so he would have been considered, or they would have been considered real trailblazers. I wonder what type of uh, reception they would have received in um, and he, one would, must assume would, that it wasn't uh, uh, that it was a difficult thing. Uh, uh, 
what it does more than anything else is indicate just what a rebel uh, Lockwood was, that he was uh, willing to confront uh, public opinion in that way. Uh, I, I think it's really quite remarkable. Yes, I don't think there's another example of it in poli the political life of New Brunswick, certainly not someone who rose so high and, yeah. uh, and maybe even Nova Scotia or maybe even Canada. So I think that that is our, our last question. Uh, Brenda Orr said, thank you very much. Very interesting presentation, Nicholas. And um, I'm going to uh, thank you to everyone for coming tonight and especially to uh, Dr. Tracy for making the seventh presentation in the York Sunbury Historical Society's virtual speaker series. Now I want to remind everyone that the next presentation in the series will be on Thursday, April 16, featuring major retired Hal Scarrup, who is going to be speaking about the amazing Stanton Friedman, UFO expert, whose life experiences are the focus of an up, a new exhibit uh, being installed at the museum this summer. And so we hope to see you again next month. And if you have any questions, you can always contact us at the Fredericton Region Museum at our telephone number 455-6041 or by email at fredertonregionmuseum at gmail.com. You can check out our website, www.fredertonregionmuseum.com or check out our Facebook for all the latest happenings. Thank you everybody. And we'll see you again next month. Mm -hmm.